Hi there. In this video, we'll be discussing the use of cast iron radiators in the geothermal heating system for the home, which is more practical than you might think. I'll first briefly describe the system in my own house, then we'll look at some of the factors you need to consider in the design and sizing of the system. Although I have a background in physics, I'm not a heating or plumbing professional. Nevertheless, with some relatively simple calculations, I was able to design a system and hire the necessary contractors to install it. In switching from fuel oil to geothermal, I reduced my heating bill from over $1,000 a year to a little over $300 a year. So this is the house. It's a one-story constructed of concrete block faced with stucco built in 1946. We've got some solar panels on the roof here. It's a three-bedroom, about 1,400 square feet with a half basement, and is heated with 10 cast iron radiators. Here's a few of the bedrooms. Here's the one in the kitchen, the dining room, and the living room has two of these really big ones. When we bought it, the house had basically no insulation, and I've improved on that somewhat. We had polymer foam injected from the outside into the core cavities in the concrete blocks. I still have to paint over the drill holes here. I also poured some marine foam into the three-quarter inch space between the block and the sheetrock. Together that gives us an insulation of about R10. Not great, but still twice as good as the original building. Here's the schematic of the geothermal heating system. It starts with two vertical boreholes, each 360 feet deep. In each of those is a loop of one and a quarter inch high density polyethylene pipe that contains a water methanol mixture. This flow center has two pumps that circulate that solution through the ground loops and into the evaporator side of a Bosch 3 ton TW035 water to water heat pump. It has a compressor and a refrigerant loop and then on the load or condenser side, it has another heat exchanger. And we simply splice that into the old distribution system to the radiators. We've got two pumps with high efficiency electronically commutated or ECM motors, one on each side of the heat exchanger. And they're always set on maximum, which gives a flow rate of about 10 gallons a minute and consumes only 43 watts each. The radiators are connected in a so-called monoflow distribution system. It's a one-pipe system with special T-joints that direct a small fraction of the water flow to each radiator, while allowing most of the heated water to continue on to the downstream radiators. You might think that the radiators at the start of the circuit would be a lot hotter than the ones at the tail end, but at these flow rates, there's actually only a few degrees difference, and the house is heated pretty evenly, much more so than when we were burning oil. The whole system is controlled with this single thermostat, which turns on all four pumps as well as the compressor. Now, if you know anything about heat hydronic heating systems, you'll notice that what conspicuously absent here is a buffer tank. The reason is that with all the thermal mass of 10 radiators, you really don't need a buffer tank. In fact, you're better off without one. With a couple of manual ball valves, we can easily switch back to the old oil-fired boiler in case of exceptionally cold weather. But in fact, in four years of operation, we've never had to do that. We've always got sufficient heat from the geothermal system. So here we are in the half basement. Up here is my mechanical room. It's not quite as tall as me. There's the flow center. And the water methanol mixture is coming in through this insulated pipe here. And down through the flow center, pump back up and over and down into the source side of the Bosch heat pump. Goes back up and out through this pipe and back out to the uh, back out to the loops. Over here is the load side of the heat pump and we have here the two ECM circulators. You can see they're running at 42 watts and about 10 gallons a minute. And the water is going up through some ball valves into the uh, old expansion valve and then out through this pipe into the radiators. Up here is the old expansion tank which we're still using. And coming through the wall there is the return from the radiators. That green valve controls the balance between the two branches of the uh, radiator circuit. And the water comes back down again through some ball valves and back 
into the heat pump. Over here is the old oil fired uh, boiler, which again we can cut in very easily if necessary, but we've never had to do that. And this little gadget over here is the web uh, energy logger, which records various temperatures and uh, power uses by the system. Down here is the Hall effect sensor, and that measures the current to the uh, heat pump. Here's a breakdown of the cost of the system. By far the main expense was the drilling for the ground loops. This was about $14,000, which included the flow center, connections to the heat pump, and the filling and purging of the loops. The drillers came in with a big drill rig and spent almost a week drilling and making a royal mess of the backyard, but it's mostly recovered now. The heat pump was about $3,400, which is less than half what you'd pay if you bought one from a heating contractor. The technology in this area is changing so quickly that you can get recent but obsolete units pretty cheaply from liquidators on eBay, although usually there is no warranty. I paid a local plumber about $2,700 to link the heat pump to the radiator circulation system and for the 230 volt wiring to the heat pump. I spent about another $500 on miscellaneous items such as the circulator pump and thermostat, and then another $500 for the monitoring system. So total was just under 21000 or more like 15000 after the 30% federal tax credit. As far as operating costs, I estimate we were spending about $1,200 for 400 gallons of fuel oil per year at $3 a gallon, plus $120 annual maintenance on the boiler. Now we're spending about $360 for 3,000 kilowatt hours of electricity. In principle, there is no annual maintenance, and in fact, none has been required in four years' operation, so we're saving almost $1,000 per year compared to oil. Even natural gas would be about double what we're paying now, once you add in $200 a year just for staying connected to the gas line. Here are some data from the energy logger. This is from February of this year. This plot shows the outdoor temperature in green, room temperature in black, and radiator temperature in brown. One thing you can see is that due to the large thermal mass of the radiators, the heating cycles are fairly long. Here we've got about eight cycles in a 12-hour period, so the system's turning on less than once per hour. And that's good because the less frequently the compressor cycles on and off, the longer it's going to last. You can also see that the radiator temperature is just a mirror image of the outdoor temperature, so the system keeps the radiators just warm enough to compensate for the heat loss through the walls, which is roughly proportional to the difference between the indoor and outdoor temperatures. Since the room temperature is midway between the outdoor and radiator temperatures, that means that this little radiator has as much influence on the temperature of the room as 200 square feet of exterior wall space. Of course, the wall is insulated and the radiator is directly exposed to the air in the room, but still, it shows just how efficiently these old radiators distribute heat into a room. I've been impressed with how low the radiator temperatures are. Here's a stretch where it was 35 degrees outside, and the radiators are on average just below 100 degrees, in other words, human body temperature. And here where it's 45 degrees outside, they're even lower, about 90 degrees. This plot shows the leaving low temperature, which is the temperature of the water coming out of the heat pump in red and entering water temperature in blue. Here, leaving low temperature peaks at about 110 degrees. It's generally about 5 degrees above the radiator temperature. We try to minimize that difference because the higher the heat pump has to raise the water temperature, the less efficient it is. Now, since we measure the entering and leaving water temperatures as well as the flow rate, we can calculate how much heat the heat pump is producing. And dividing that by the electrical input power, we get a ratio called the coefficient of performance, or COP. So here in blue, we have a real-time plot of COP for a stretch when the outdoor temperature was in the mid-40s. You can see that at the start of a heating cycle, COP was about 4, so we're producing 4 kilowatts of heat for every kilowatt of electricity consumed. As the water heats up, COP drops, reaching about 3 by the end of the cycle, so the average is about 3.5. At the other extreme, here are some data from the coldest night so far, January 8, 2018, when a polar vortex dropped the outdoor temperature to just about zero. With the system running continuously all night, the radiators leveled off at just under 120 degrees, 
you can see that the room temperature dipped ever so slightly, so we're right at the limit of capacity of the system. The water was leaving the heat pump at 125 degrees, shown here in red, which is close to its rated maximum, and COP was about 2.2. So again, the higher the leaving low temperature, the lower the efficiency. So it's important to heat the water just enough to maintain room temperature and to transfer it from the heat pump to the radiators with as little resistance as possible. Our average COP for heating season is about 3. This graph shows monthly electricity consumption in black and the indoor-outdoor temperature difference in degree days in green. Coincidentally, we use almost exactly one kilowatt hour for every degree day of heating load. Now you might wonder why this heating system works at all when it was designed for much higher water temperatures, typically around 180 degrees. While it's true that radiators were meant for higher temperatures, it's also true that if a house is old enough to have them, chances are it was not very well insulated. And whether you upgrade the heating system or not, it's almost always cost effective to first do whatever you can to improve the insulation. Now, since most of these old heating systems were designed with a fair amount of excess capacity, it's likely that with better insulation, they'll have enough heating capacity to work quite well with the lower geothermal temperatures. But let's look at how you can determine whether that's the case. This chart is from the Runtall Radiator website, and it shows the relative amount of radiated heat as a function of water temperature. As you can see, the expected heat radiated at 130 degrees, which is about the maximum for most heat pumps, is roughly half that radiated at 180 degrees. So you first need to determine whether your radiators can supply enough heat at 130 degrees to maintain room temperature, as well as determine how large a heat pump you'll need to heat the water. The traditional approach is to do what's called a manual J calculation, where you estimate the R factors and the resulting heat loss through the walls, the windows, and the roof, as well as the heat loss due to infiltration of outside air into the house. But this is complicated and involves a lot of assumptions. If you have an existing heating system, it's often easier to just estimate how much heat you're actually using. You need to first know the output of your existing boiler. For a gas-fired boiler, this should be stated in boiler specifications. For an oil-fired boiler, it's a little more complicated because it depends on the nozzle size in the burner. You should be able to get that information from whoever services the boiler. Otherwise, you'll need to take the nozzle out of the boiler, which isn't difficult, and there are many YouTube videos showing how to do this. The fuel velocity in gallons per hour will be engraved on the nozzle. You need to multiply that by the heat content of a gallon of fuel oil, which is about 140,000 BTUs, corrected by the efficiency of the boiler. Most modern boilers are rated at 85%, but that's for a perfectly tuned boiler, so let's say about 80%. In my particular case, I had a 0 0.95 gallon per hour nozzle, so I should be getting about 106,000 BTUs per hour whenever the burner is running. Now you need to pick a very cold night and determine how much heat is being used by tracking how much time the burner is on. Again, in my case, I found that on a 10 degree night, the burn was running about one third of the time, or about 20 minutes every hour. So on average, I was using 106,000 times a third, or about 35,000 BTUs per hour. Heat pump capacity is measured in tons, where a ton equals 12,000 BTUs per hour, so I knew I needed a three ton heat pump. Note that you need to be timing the burner, not the circulation pump, which is irrelevant to the calculation. If you want to design for a colder night than the night of the test, you can correct your estimate by the ratio of the temperature difference. For example, if it takes 20,000 BTUs per hour to maintain 70 degree room temperature on a 35 degree night, it will take roughly twice that, or 40,000 BTUs per hour, to maintain that temperature on a zero degree night. Now you need to estimate the amount of heat distributed by each radiator at the maximum heat pump temperature, typically about 130 degrees. Radiators are characterized by their equivalent direct radiation, or EDR, which is the size of a flat surface that would emit the same amount of heat as that radiator, expressed in square feet. There are numerous charts and indeed whole books available listing EDR for various radiator types. Here's a chart I found on the Slant Fin website. It lists several radiator types, some with columns, some with tubes. My radiators are mostly five tubes and six inches wide. This one has 16 sections, 26 inches high, and has an EDR of 3 per section. So that gives me an EDR of 48 square feet for the whole radiator. 
For the 10 radiators in my house, total EDR was 556 square feet. At 180 degree water temperature, a radiator emits 170 BTUs per hour per square foot of EDR. So at 130 degrees, it will emit 48% as much, or 82 BTUs per hour. So for 130 degree water from a heat pump, my system would produce 556 times 82, or 45,592 BTUs per hour. That should be more than adequate to heat the house, and indeed it was. But I also tested the heating capacity of the system by turning down the temperature setting on my oil-fired boiler. That's set on the control box on the boiler. I picked a cold night and temporarily set the low temperature to 120 degrees and the upper temperature to 130 degrees. That means when the room thermostat is calling for heat, the boiler water will be heated to 130 degrees. In fact, the system was able to maintain room temperature at those settings. If you do this test, be sure to return the boiler to its normal settings of 160 to 180 degrees. Otherwise, you could get condensation and corrosion in the boiler. If you find you don't get quite enough heat at 130 degrees, there are some special units such as the water furnace 504W11 that will heat water to about 144 degrees, and the Nordic WC series from Maritime Geothermal that will heat to 160 degrees, almost as hot as an oil-fired boiler. Now you might ask, if I wanted radiant heat, why not go with underfloor radiant, which often uses water temperatures of less than 100 degrees? Well, it turns out that with the thick wood floors in my house, the required water temperatures would be about the same as with radiators, and of course it would cost thousands of dollars more to install. I'd also have to worry about overheating and warping the floor, whereas radiators are basically indestructible. But I've also got central air conditioning, also geothermal, and running off a separate heat pump. Why not just use that in reverse for heating? One reason is that the round diffusers in the ceiling were designed to disperse the cooled air horizontally along the ceiling and would all have to be replaced with square registers that direct the heated air downward. That would be expensive as well as disruptive. In a house with relatively poor insulation, there would still be some stratification where the heated air from the ceiling vents would tend to rise and stay near the ceiling, while cool air would sink to the floor, so average temperature would have to be higher to compensate. But the main reason is that we just like the radiant heat better than forced air. It's gentle and quiet, usually you can't even tell it's running, and it doesn't kick up dust and allergens like a forced air system. So that's my pitch for geothermal with radiators. It's an effective mix of old and new technology. It's not all that common, but there are several other installations described on the web, and I've listed some of those links in the description, so have a look. But if you want to do anything geothermal, you should act quickly. 2019 is the last year of the full 30% federal tax credit. In 2020, it drops to 26%, and by 2022, it's gone entirely. So I hope you found this video helpful, and thanks for watching.